See, I think Putin will settle for the devastation of Ukraine. I think he could claim that as a victory. The utter devastation of the Ukraine, because it stays out of Western hands. But if Putin ever believed that his people even believed that they were now under attack, let's say by German tanks, let's say, the probability that he's used a tactical, tactical battlefield nuclear weapon seems to me to be extraordinarily high. For me, it's like, well, why wouldn't he? And the issue is, well, you don't want to escalate. It's like, yeah, that's already factored into the decision. The fact that they're even theorizing about any of this without recognizing the, the very direct and real cost to human civilization on this planet, we can look throughout history to see how U.S. foreign policy, especially in regime change wars, have failed so spectacularly in different regions around the world because they go and pick which dictator they like or don't like. Well, we'll take this guy out, replace him with this guy. And then all of these disastrous unintended negative consequences come both for the United States and the people in these countries. Yet here we are now where we are facing that exact same prospect with the country that has the most nuclear weapons in the entire world. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Tulsi Gabbard, an American politician, commentator, and a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Reserves. She served as the U.S. representative for Hawaii's second congressional district across four terms from 2013 until 2021. She was the first female combat veteran to run for president, as well as the first Hindu member of Congress and the first Samoan American voting member. Both during and after her terms in office, Gabbard has been a formidable voice in the political space, leaning right of center, despite her Democrat origins, with continued appearances on Fox News, while retaining more progressive views on topics such as drug legalization. She is the host of her own program, the Tulsi Gabbard Show, where she continues to speak on relevant issues with the following axiom firmly in mind, country before party. Thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me today. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I thought maybe we'd start by talking about your experience, your history with the Democrats. If you could just mm. walk us through that. I mean, you've had a, well, you had a stellar rise within the confines of the, dem of the, of the party and then a certain amount of friction. And maybe you could just walk us through that. You were elected very, very young. Yes. And so maybe we could start with that. And, and, and could you just tell the story of being involved with the Democrats? Well, I, so, so I, growing up here in Hawaii, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. And, and from a young age, um, had a pretty deep appreciation for the importance of um, protecting this place, you know, protecting our oceans and the preservation of clean water. We, we get our water here from water aquifers. And as the rem most remote island chain in the world, protecting those resources are, are essential for life. And so my, my um, motivation and drive to run for the State House of Representatives here in Hawaii when I was 21 years old in 2002 really came from, from that motivation to want to be in a position where I could actually do that. You know, I, I previously, I had, uh, they wanted to build a big landfill over one of our big water aquifers here, which, you know, even for me as a teenager seemed like such an absurd idea and risk because once that water is contaminated, then it's it's done. Uh, and so I was part of, you know, I went out and got petitions and signatures and joined others to be able to try to stop that because it was being, um, uh, the, the wheels were being greased by a corrupt politician, essentially, who was trying to help his buddy who ran the landfill business. And it was a, a great experience for me as a young person to be a part of stopping that from happening. And that's what drove me to, um, to run for office when I was 21 years old. It was not out of uh, any kind of design, like, oh, I'm going to have this big political career and this will be the first stepping stone to get to somewhere else. It was really driven by a desire to be of service and make that positive impact. Um, 
I chose to be a Democrat. Uh, you know, my family was, it wasn't one of those like legacy party affiliation things that you just did. I really was thoughtful at that time about uh, which box I wanted to check in filing those papers to, to run for office. And you know, for us here in Hawaii, the origins of the Democratic Party really came from um, a party that fought for people. Uh, kind of a more populist uh, perspective. We had plantation workers who were being absolutely abused and taken advantage of by the huge landowners here in, in the state that was essentially being run by elite wealthy Republicans at the time. And uh, it was a Democratic Party that fought for those who didn't have a voice. It was a Democratic Party that celebrated civil liberties, that celebrated freedom and individual thought, this big tent party that really was rooted in kind of those, those traditional liberal JFK-esque uh, ideals. And uh, it was a party that had many voices that spoke out for peace. And so all of these different things really drew me to the Democratic Party as a party that would fight for the voices of the mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. You know, in Canada, we have... Uh socialist tradition, the New Democratic Party, and I worked for them when I was a kid. Uh, the man I worked for was the father of Alberta's last premier, uh, second last premier, and a lot of the people that were involved in the NDP were labor leaders, you know. Mm. It was well known in Canada that the conservatives were the party of the establishment and the liberals were, well, they played both sides against the middle very effectively, and the socialists, the NDP, British socialists, rather than the communist type, were really, they're really the voice of the working class. They're the voice mm. of the unions. And the working class needs a voice, obviously. And I think, well, the NDP did provide that to some degree in Canada, and the Democrats historically did provide that. That seemed to go pretty damn sideways with Clinton. Yeah. And yeah. I think it looked to me, from, from an outsider's point of view, and I was rather appalled by this, that the Democrats had decided to sacrifice their traditional base, the working class, um, you know, the, the committed working class for something approximating the politics of division and this, I don't know, whatever this new narrative is of, of exactly. oppression and victimization. And I don't think that worked out very well either, as far as I could tell, because my sense of the Clinton-Trump debacle was that it wasn't so much that Trump won, although he certainly did. It was definitely the case that Clinton won lost. Yes. And I think she did that by sacrificing the interests of the working class. Trump just vacuumed that up in no time flat, masterfully, I thought. He seemed yeah. to have that ability to communicate with working class people, interestingly enough, and they trusted him. At least they trusted him in comparison to Clinton. Yes. So, okay, so you were, you were interested in the Democrats because of that working class voice tradition. And you worked with the Democrats for a long time. How long was your, how long you, you, you ran when you were 21? That was in when, 2000? That was in 2002. 2002, right. So, and when did you formally sever ties with the Democrats? In October of last year, 2022. Right, so, so it was basically 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did not spend all of that time uh, in politics. I uh, left the state house when I, uh, volunteered to deploy with our Hawaii Army National Guard unit uh, because the events of 9/11, like so many Americans, um, you know, changed changed my life, changed my perspective, and and uh, I had enlisted in the military, motivated by what happened there, to go after the the Islamist terrorists who attacked us on that day. And so I was I was campaigning for re-election here in Hawaii in 2004, um, which looked to be a pretty easy re-election here and to continue the work I was doing. Our unit or the, the National Guard unit was activated for a deployment to Iraq. I was told by my commander, you know, congratulations, you don't have to go. Your name is, you know, we've already got someone filling this job in the medical unit where I was serving. Uh, so you can stay home and, and you can continue doing what you're doing. But mm. I knew that there was no way, um, there was just no way that I could stay back and work in some plush office in the state capitol and watch my brothers and sisters um, in uniform go and deploy to war on the other side of the world. And so I, I left my re-election campaign and uh, volunteered to deploy, got trained in a different job that they needed filling in that medical unit uh, and uh, went off on an 18 month long uh, deployment. Mm -hmm. So what do you what do you learn what do you learn from that? So exactly. You got hauled that. out of your life. What what do you learn? Yeah. 
so much, uh, so much about um, the cost of war, uh, both f- in 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 the loss of people who I was close to, people who I served with, as well as people who I I had never met. One one the very first thing that I did in my job while I served in Iraq, we were we were in a camp about forty miles north of Baghdad, and the very first thing that I did every single day that I was there was to go through a list of names of American service soldiers who uh, were serving all across that country uh, who had been injured or or hurt in combat the day before, in the previous 24 hours. And I had to go through that list name by name to look to see if there were any of the soldiers from our brigade, which was about close to 3,000 people who were serving in four different parts of Iraq at the time, uh, to make sure that, okay, well, this person has been injured, they've been hurt, uh, where are they? Are they getting the care that they need? Are they able to um, get what they need in country and return to duty? Uh, do they need to be evacuated quickly? And basically make sure that they had what they need, whether they were staying in country, we, we eventually got them back home uh, to their families if they had to leave. But every single day being confronted with the, the high human cost of war um, that is is just so often not discussed or talked about in the headlines or even thought about by politicians, even if they might give lip service to it. And also, therefore, coming from, um, you know, serving in the state house and even some of our local politicians in Hawaii, they would come out and visit the troops, get the photo op, be on the ground for maybe 24, 48 hours, and then go back and say all of these things as though they knew it was happening. And, and just the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of the politicians in Washington that voted for that war uh, in Iraq, but really without any care for the consequences of that decision, or even thinking through what are we actually doing here? Is it serving the interests yeah. of the American people? Is it- Yeah, well, what, and what were you doing there as far as you're concerned? You know, you've had lots of time to think about it now and you were actually there yeah. and- so well, for our, what, our, our unit, so our specific unit there uh, was there to go after different terrorist elements. This was kind of where Al-Qaeda was growing stronger, and obviously the rise of ISIS would occur a little later after, after we left. But, uh, you know, we, we had a number of different infantry units that were going around in different areas and trying to seek out those insurgents uh, that were attacking Americans. And that was that was the specific mission that we had. My, I was served in a medical unit, and so we were we were providing care primarily for uh, our American troops, uh, but also um, going out and and trying to help provide care for local Iraqis in the area where we were. Um, I visited Abu Ghraib prison. This was after after the scandal occurred, but I visited the hospital at Abu Ghraib prison and was struck there about the medical care that was being provided there uh, to, to the prisoners, um, which was exactly the same kind of care that, that we were providing uh, to, to injured service members who were also in, in the country. Um, but it was, it was seeing past kind of the day-to-day tasks there in, in the, being exposed on the, literally on the front lines to the war profiteering and the military industrial complex, mm-hmm. um, the, the monopoly of KBR Halliburton uh, making a, an immeasurable amount of money off right. of this war. Again, this was, I was there for all of 2005 in Iraq and that was in the early days. Uh, and you look at what has happened since uh, over the ensuing decades in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and again, you know, my exposure in, in Hawaii as a state legislator was very limited when it comes to foreign policy. There wasn't, you know, a lot that I knew, but being there, experiencing it, and at a basic level, understanding government spending and taxpayer dollars and how are we using it, the accountability and going and talking to these uh, you know, they called them, they labeled them third country nationals. They would import in from places like Nepal and the Philippines and Sri Lanka, pay them pennies, essentially, compared to how much they were charging the federal government to do things like, mm-hmm. okay, well, we're going to cook food for the troops every day. And, you know, I started asking, well, how, how, you know, if I walk into the chow hall tent or building or whatever and get a bowl of cereal and a banana for breakfast, 
how much is how much how much is KBR Halliburton charging the U.S. federal government for that? And it was some outrageous price in 2005. It was like forty dollars per mm-hmm. service member per meal. They mm-hmm. served four meals a day, and then started. We made friends with with these people from the Philippines and Nepal and Sri Lanka who were working there. After I was like, how much are you getting paid? Oh, five hundred dollars a month. Right. Five hundred dollars. So so a that, that actually answers one of the questions I wanted to bring up later. You know, I guess you've answered it in two ways, is that one of the reasons I have a certain sympathy for people like Bernie Sanders and more recently for people like both Russell Brand and uh, Joe Rogan is because there's a there's a necessary voice on the left that targets something like corporate governance, government media collusion at the highest levels, yes. right? The construction of these gigantic, tentacled, multilateral organizations that engage in regulatory capture and then turn into, let's say, what Eisenhower warned everybody about in relationship to the military-industrial complex. And right. there's a necessary voice on the left that I don't think precisely should be striving against capitalism per se. I think that's the big mistake, but should be striving against fascist corporate government collusion. And Mm -hmm. we should all be striving against that, that's for sure. It'd be nice to get that straightened out. But you did, I think, answer some of my question about why I was going to ask you later about why you supported Bernie Sanders. But we'll get back to that. So Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about that later. Yeah, okay, okay. So I got a question for you also. Now, I'm curious about what, how your views developed and what they are now about the issue of women in combat. You know, we've opened up the military to female participation. And generally speaking, it appears that opening up avenues of participation to women has immense benefits for women if handled correctly for children, certainly on the economic front, it doubles the pool of available talent for everyone. I know the best predictor of development in the third world is rights accorded to women, especially on the economic front. So that all looks like a good thing. But then, you know, I have my skepticism about the practical and ethical utility of placing women on the front lines, for example, in battle positions. And there's obviously a huge disparity in physical strength. Um, and pro- probably an innate aggression, and you know, and that could go one way or another because it isn't completely obvious that the most aggressive soldiers are the best, even though that might seem self-evident. Mm-hmm. Now you, you've uh, well, you've been there. So what did you conclude about the 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 integration of women into the armed forces? What's good about that, and and what's not good about it? Assuming there is anything not good about it. My, my, my position on this, and this is based on my experience, is that we should have the best people for the job, whatever that job may be, the people who are best equipped, who are best trained, who have the capabilities, both you know, mental, emotional, and physical, and that women on their face simply for their gender should not be disqualified from various jobs simply mm-hmm. because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I have served alongside, obviously, many men and women, uh, people who uh, have been very good at their jobs because of their skills and their capabilities and others who, who don't have those skills and capabilities. And so whether those jobs are serving as an infantry soldier or uh, an artillery soldier, whether you're serving in a combat uh, unit or a support unit, What I want, both as a soldier, who I want to be serving alongside, but also I think when you look at this from a policy perspective, what we should want as a country is we we need the best people who are going to do, who are best equipped to do the job. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not all women are best equipped to serve in a combat unit. Not all men are best equipped to serve in a combat unit. So there should not be um, an arbitrary standard simply based on gender, but rather set the standard and if you meet the standard, whether you're a man or a woman, then you want the job, go get it. I, I don't yeah. believe so in- So it's pure merit-based evaluation Correct. as far as you're concerned. Correct. I guess that would bring up, that brings up two problems, I suppose, is one is that there are physical standards set for jobs like firefighter and policeman and, right. and obviously military practitioner, soldier, and those 
standards, especially in elite units, are extremely high. I mean, they're high enough so most men can't manage them at all. And because of the difference, especially in upper body strength, women have a lot of stamina, but difference in upper body strength really differentiates men from women. If the physical standards are set high enough to exclude, say, 95% of men, they're, de they're going to exclude virtually all women. And then the question comes up, well, should you keep the standards? And obviously, some level of physical uh, prowess is necessary, but if the standard is 100% exclusionary on the sex front, then it raises the question of whether the standard itself is sexist, let's say, in a counterproductive manner. And so, sure, thoughts well, I about think, that? I think the question is the question is what is what is the basis for the standard? I, and I know that there are some standards that have been set traditionally and in the military, well, this is an elite unit, so the standards must must be exclusionary, so we yeah, only get yeah. the most elite people. But are those standards simply based on a concept of elitism, I guess, in this context? Or are they yeah. set based on the conditions that soldiers serving in that particular unit will be likely to face? Are they right, based right. On, on the reality of the, the requirements of the job? And so if we're in a situation, and there are jobs, both in the military, as you mentioned, first responders and others, if those standards are set on a realistic assessment of what this job will require, and it turns out that, hey, one out of 100 women who apply actually qualifies, then so be it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, whatever, if there are a greater number of men who qualify, then so be it. Uh, if we yeah, have yeah. people who get these jobs who cannot do the job, then it's pointless. And it puts themselves and it puts the entire unit and mission at risk uh, right. in doing so. Despite the U.S. blowing through the $31.4 trillion debt ceiling last month, the White House still refuses to reduce spending. Our national leadership has buried their heads in the sand, but you don't have to. Call the experts at Birch Gold today and start diversifying into gold. For over 5,000 years, gold has withstood inflation, geopolitical turmoil, and stock market crashes. With help from the experts at Birch Gold, you can own gold in a tax-sheltered retirement account. Birch Gold makes it easy to convert an IRA or 401k into an IRA in precious metals. Just text Jordan to 989898 to claim your free info kit on gold and then talk to one of their precious metal specialists. With an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, thousands of happy customers, and countless five-star reviews, you can trust Birch Gold to help protect your savings. Text Jordan to 989898 today. Well, there's a measurement science that's been devoted to this for a long time, and, and there are actually guidelines for psychologists who do assessment, let's say, in relationship to a particular job. Some of those are enshrined in appropriate law. And then the notion is, first of all, that you have to do a job analysis, which is, okay, what is it that the people who are doing this job, who are good at it, spend the bulk of their time doing? Sure. And you can measure that, although that's not easy. For example, it's not that easy to measure the performance of a middle manager, for example, mm -hmm. in a corporation, because the outcomes are difficult to specify. But but you can do a better or worse job of that. And if you do a good job, then you can find out what predicts prowess and you mm -hmm. can do that statistically. And then you can, then you define merit, right? Merit is what makes you, makes it likely that you will do very well doing whatever this job is for. That's merit. And, and that can be handled properly. The problem is, as you alluded to, if you accept merit defined in that manner as the gold standard, then you're going to have to accept the outcome, which is that there isn't going to be radical equity yes. at all levels of analysis in the candidate pool. And so you That's have true. to forego that. And it certainly seems, I would say, that on the left side of things now, people are almost entirely unwilling to forego that equity outcome. I mean, even Kamala Harris, who should have known better, tweeted out a few weeks ago, her support for this concept of equity. And people who aren't paying attention think that means equality of opportunity, which is not what it means at all, which is why it's a different word. It means that if the outcomes of the selection process aren't equal across all conceivable combinations of ethnicity and gender, its sex, et cetera, that uh, intersectional morass, then the system is by definition exclusionary and prejudiced. And that, well, that just kills that just kills merit, assuming that merit is not 
completely equally distributed. Now, one other question on the female front. So one of the things that's disturbed my conscience with regards to women on the front lines is that there's always the possibility that you'll fall into the hands of the enemy. And it wasn't very much fun for, let's say, British and American prisoners of war in Nazi camps in uh, World War II, although there were some Geneva Convention arrangements that were still in place. But I can't imagine what it would be like to be a frontline woman who fell into enemy hands. I mean, that's a level of absolute bloody catastrophic hell that I think that that we should be very, very cautious about exposing anyone to. And so I have a proclivity to think that women are differentially susceptible to exploitation on the captured enemy front. And I don't know exactly, you know, given credence to what you say about making sure we have the most qualified people, you know, maybe you can ask people to face their death. I don't know if you're, if it's okay to ask them to face endless gang rape and then death. You know, that's, that's pushing the envelope. And so I don't know what you think about that. I imagine you, that thoughts of that sort must have gone through your mind from time to sure. time. Sure. It is, it is the most, um, war, war is tragic and ugly to say the least. And you're facing some of the most horrific conditions, uh, which is one of the reasons why I don't support the draft is because as a soldier, I don't want to be serving alongside anybody who hasn't made that choice to be there, who hasn't made that choice mm -hmm. to be willing to make those sacrifices, not only to give up one's life in service to our country, but to face the plethora of what could be the absolute worst case scenarios. Um, that, that, that's my perspective. And, and so whether it's uh, those scenarios are facing a male or a female soldier, uh, these are some of the things that, you know, both the training of, of the practical implications, but obviously, uh, the mental preparation for how anything could possibly go bad uh, is essential before sending troops into that situation. Okay, so your sense, your, it sounds like your sense is that, you know, if people have been fully apprised of the risks, and I think we outlined the most substantive risk on the female side, if people are fully apprised of that risk and there's evidence that they actually understand what that means, which is no simple matter, that it's okay to allow them to make that choice. But you that's partly why you introduced the idea that there's no compulsion in military conscription. Yeah. Also partly because you don't get the best out of people if they're compelled, exactly. obviously. So, okay, so, so anything else on the combat front or can we turn back to the Democrats? I, I'd like you to do it. Well, let's, I'll, 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 I'll walk us back into that because um, it, it it, it is what motivated me to run for Congress. We talked about, you know, okay, well, I've, I've been with the Democratic Party for, for 20 years. I chose to join the Democratic Party. Uh, my experience on two Middle East deployments is what really drove me to, uh, to run for Congress. It wasn't something I had great any ambition for, frankly, uh, when I ran for the State House in 2002. But being exposed to the cost of war, being exposed to the both the military industrial complex, but what you described very well earlier is this, this collusion in the narrative and the push coming from elected officials in Washington, the, the establishment of people in both political parties who are part of this warmongering uh, uniparty, uh, the, so much of, of, I guess, the mainstream media or legacy media that we have seen uh, you know, amp up and beat the drums for war over and over, not, not interested in actually exposing the truth or asking any tough questions as it comes to foreign policy and the decisions uh, to go to war. And of course, now even more so, we're seeing big tech being a, a, a major uh, contributor in, in this uh, establishment narrative. It's what drove me to, to run for Congress, to be able to be in a position where I could um, actually serve in a place to help make decisions that would prevent us from continuing to go and wage these costly counterproductive wars that, that actually end up undermining our own country's uh, national security. 
one of the main decisions why I chose, one of the main reasons why I chose to leave the Democratic Party is because the Democratic Party has become uh, the war party. Those voices that we talked about a little bit on the left who challenged uh, the, the military industrial complex, challenged this mm-hmm. pro-war um, narrative that we're seeing across the board, um, I, I don't see them anymore. And worse yet, we have leaders in the Democratic Party who are the ones who are actually amping up uh, these, these counterproductive wars, who are amping up these new cold wars against Russia and China, who are amping up and escalating and pushing us to the brink of, of nuclear war, which is where we sit right now uh, as a nation, which, which threatens us and, and threatens the world, frankly, uh, and doing so without any thought or consideration for uh, the reality of something that was, was very eye-opening for us here in Hawaii back in January of 2018 when we had, uh, well, we, had, we had a missile alert where we thought that North Korea was sending a nuclear missile to us and that we had 15 minutes to live. The government telling us, oh, seek shelter immediately. This is not a drill, missile inbound to Hawaii. But we were confronted with the reality that there is no shelter. There is literally right, right, no place right. to go. To go, and so, yeah, yeah. so, So not only have our leaders failed us in the sense of getting us to this point where that is now a reality that every single one of us lives with right now, but also they tell us, oh, seek shelter, get inside, stay inside. There is no shelter. They may have some fancy shelters where they may be able to survive and continue to wage war in the event that we get there, but the vast majority of people in this country and people around the world will be the ones that suffer the catastrophic uh, consequences of a nuclear holocaust. There is no shelter. They have not provided that shelter. And so this question of, of how my experience is there on these deployments, the, the experiences that I've had throughout this time uh, was one of the main reasons why I left the Democratic Party. And frankly, it was one of the main reasons that, that uh, back in 2016, that I saw the necessity to leave as vice chair of the DNC to go and, and speak out against uh, Hillary Clinton's warmongering record as she was trying to become our country's commander in chief and the dangers of what would happen if that became a reality. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it was primarily a consequence of concerns about, well, concerns about the military industrial complex. Okay, let's segue for a minute then. Um, I made a couple of videos about the Russia-Ukraine war, you know, making a foray into a domain that's obviously contentious enough to produce a war, let's say. And uh, here's my problem. Um, I don't understand... Now, I've listened to a lot of hawks on the American side talk about, well, two things, about the fact that it appears likely, and this is independent of the merits of this claim, it appears likely that the Ukraine supported by the West in the manner it has been supported, can do serious damage to Russia's uh, conventional arms force. And I think there is evidence that the Ukrainians and the West are pushing the the Russians back, and God only knows how far that will go. And uh, the hawks that I've talked to said, that's a good thing. It's in our interest to ensure that Russia is no longer a conventional military threat. And No, I have a certain degree of sympathy for that viewpoint, but then here's the counter problem as as I see it. So I try to look forward into the future and I think, okay, what does a victory for the West look like? Forget about Ukraine. Ukraine victory is they get their territory back and there's a wall between them and the Russians and the pesky Russians leave them alone and they go back to whatever level of appalling corruption they had managed before the war. And so that's the Ukraine victory. The West, well, let's say we could do this two ways. Okay, so Putin is deposed, however that happens, and then then what? And then we have a better leader in Russia? We have a more trustworthy leader? Yeah, I don't think so. The Russians haven't got a great history of that. And no matter what you think of Putin, it's definitely the case that he isn't the worst leader that emerged in Russia in the last hundred years by any measure. So that's a big problem. And then I think, well, instead of Putin being replaced by someone who could be better, but probably won't be, 
we'll have a Russia that's really fragmented and that, you know, the, the country in some ways collapses. And that's a really bad idea because there's a lot of nuclear bombs there. And if you get the fragmentation of that power structure into multiple uh, chieftains, let's say, and a few of them emerge armed with nuclear bombs, then we have a major problem on our hands. And that seems to me to be a highly likely outcome. And so, and then if we weaken Russia severely and permanently, then we have the problem of a severely and permanently weakened Russia. And that's a big problem because they produce a lot of fertilizer and the Europeans happen to be dependent on them for a lot of their energy needs. So that doesn't look very wise. And then we have the absolute bloody catastrophic probability that if Putin starts to lose in any serious way, and so starts to believe that Russian territorial integrity is threatened, however he defines that, that he has an immense array of unbelievably powerful next generation weapons at his disposal, and why the hell wouldn't he use them? And yes. so, so let's walk through that. I mean, imagine the West wins. Okay, what does that mean? I don't see what that means. I, I don't, I, and I, I haven't heard anyone describe to me what the, the goal of this war is. You know, we're supporting the heroic Ukrainians. It's like, yeah, you're a, you're a moralizing scoundrel. That's not a plan. That's, that's idiot hand-waving, as bad as the environmental, you know, doomsayers. It's the same thing. Cheap moral victory. Make, make a pro... Can you make a pro and then a cautionary war case in relationship to the Russia and Ukraine? <laughs> What's in America's true interests as far as you're concerned? Well, well, this is, this is exactly, you have very clearly laid out not only the problem with how this pre President Biden and frankly, uh, Democrat and Republican leaders in Congress who are uh, applauding and pushing for and escalating this war is how short-sighted they are. But also this has been the problem in US foreign policy from our leaders for so long is, is they are not actually thinking clearly, if they're thinking at all, about what is, what is our goal? What is our objective? Yeah. What, you, you said, what does a win look like? How is it defined? Mm, even theoretically. Even theoretically, yeah. whether it's whether it's realistic or not, just saying, well, we're fighting for democracy. That, that's not yeah, that's, right. that's not a goal. Also, it's in direct um, it's in direct conflict with the reality of their actions, even here in the United States, about how many undemocratic decisions and increasingly authoritarian decisions they are making. But on this question of of the war in in, in uh, what is essentially a proxy war against Russia. The United States is waging a proxy war against Russia. Uh, the Ukrainian people uh, are paying the price. They have not outlined what a win looks like. Anytime anyone asks President Biden or anyone in the Biden administration is, when does this end? How does this end? Mm -hmm. They throw out this, this cheap one-liner of saying, well, well, that's up to Putin. Whenever Putin stops- Oh, doing good, that's good. Or, that's up to the guy with the hydrogen bombs. Exactly. That's a brilliant, that's bloody brilliant. Look, I know what I would do if I was Putin. I know it, I know it. As soon as I felt that I was in danger of a true loss. See, I think Putin will settle for the devastation of Ukraine. I think he could claim that as a victory. The utter devastation of the Ukraine because it stays out of Western hands. Mm -hmm. But if Putin ever believed that his people even believed that they were now under attack, let's say by German tanks, let's say, the probability that he's used a tactical, tactical battlefield nuclear weapon seems to me to be extraordinarily high. It's like, well- It is. For me, it's like, well, why wouldn't he? And the issue is, well, you don't want to escalate. It's like, yeah, that's already factored into the decision. So- How, there, there is this theory, I don't know if you've heard it before, of escalate to de-escalate. And so, so the the response from the U.S. government is always, well, we don't think he'll we we don't think he'll resort to that, or or uh, we don't think that 
uh, you know, we're, we're not sure. I even hear people say, well, we're not even sure that his nuclear weapons are that great or, or will really work in the way that, that uh, we, we think could cause, cause major damage. But the fact that they're even theorizing about any of this without recognizing the, the very direct and real cost to human civilization on this planet is exactly the problem. They're living in some fantasy land that it's hard to connect uh, it's hard to connect with because it's not based in the reality of the situation you're facing. And, and you have laid it out very clearly of the different possible outcomes. We've heard President Biden say and others uh, in the Department of Defense, well, we got to get rid of that guy, Putin. But not actually- For what? Not for, actually, who? for who? For, for, for who? For who? And and to what end? To what is the alternative? They have no idea who will step up or what kind of Russia will exist in the aftermath of that. We can look throughout history to see how U.S. foreign policy, especially in regime change wars, have failed so spectacularly in different regions around the world because they go and pick which dictator they like or don't like. Well, we'll take this guy out, replace him with this guy. And then all of these disastrous unintended negative consequences come both for the United States and the people in these countries. And, and yet here we are now where we are facing that exact same prospect with the country that has the most nuclear weapons in the entire world. Right, so look at what happened when, when after the Germans went into France in World War I and wreaked havoc in that idiot war, World War I. Um, their, their entire industrial machine was devastated. They had a period of hyperinflation. They were subject to that extraordinarily punitive Versailles Treaty. And yes. that could be imposed upon them because they were devastated. And hypothetically, we could do the same thing with the Russians if they're beat very badly on the conventional front and they emerge weak. And we put punitive measures in place to keep them weak. And then we might remember just exactly what happened to Germany as a consequence of the Versailles Treaty because yes. they didn't stay weak for long. And, you know, maybe the Russian nuclear weapons are no better than anything else the Soviets built, but that doesn't mean a few of them won't go off. And it's really not going to take that many because after all, they are nuclear weapons. And so even one that doesn't work that well is yes. going to be a lot more spectacular than anything that ha happened in 1945 in Hiroshima. We can be absolutely certain of that. So again, you know, the mystery is, fair enough, man, we want victory. Okay, no problem. What's the victory? Have you ever read the fine print that appears when you start browsing in incognito mode? It says that your activity might still be visible to your employer, your school, or your internet service provider. To actually stop people from monitoring your online activity, you need ExpressVPN. Think about all the times you've used Wi-Fi at a coffee shop, hotel, or even a friend's house. Without ExpressVPN, every site you visit can be logged by the admin of that network. That's still true even when you're in incognito mode. ExpressVPN is an app that encrypts all of your network data and reroutes it through a network of secure servers so that your private online activity stays private. ExpressVPN works on all your devices and is super easy to use. The app has one button, you tap it to connect, and your browsing activity is secure. Stop letting strangers invade your online privacy by visiting expressvpn.com slash Jordan. That's EXPRESSVPN.com slash Jordan and get three extra months free. ExpressVPN.com slash Jordan. One of the common responses that you, you hear from uh, both people in the White House, from politicians in Washington, uh, both when talking specifically about Russia, but you hear this very often whenever they see there's a, there's a bad actor on the world stage. Well, the United States needs to take action to punish them, to send them a message. And whether this is through economic warfare or kinetic or tactical uh, you know, warfare direct, um, whether indirect or direct, this is a, a line that they have. Well, we have to punish them. We have to punish them. And so they're making decisions about, well, we got to make life hard for them, punish them in whatever means that we can, but not actually thinking about within the context that they should be, which is for us in this country, what action should we take that is in the best interest for the well-being of the American people and our country mm -hmm. and our national security and our freedom? Mm -hmm. And who's the them? That's the other things. Well, exactly. we need to punish the Russians. It's like, well, who exactly are you talking about here? Right. Are you talking about the elites that are in control? Are you talking about the whole damn population? For how long? And, and, to, and as you already pointed out, 
To what end? To what end? So to exactly. what end? To what end is all this? And exactly. well, we, we, we touched on that a little bit. You can't, you can't help but, and this is where I suppose I turn into a leftist in some real sense, um, at least in relationship to what you might describe as a stance against gigantism. It's like, to what end? Well, how about um, military industrial profits that are staggering? How about that end? And if there's no other end in sight, and I'm not particularly skeptical about capitalism except in its gigantism forms, it's like if there's no other end being outlined, well, I'm going to go with profit as the motive because if you have a better theory, man, lay it out, but I don't see anything. And, you know, given, given, given that it was Eisenhower who, who knew what he was talking about, uh, having been supreme commander of the Allied forces, yes. when he warned about the military-industrial complex being the biggest threat we faced back in, what, about 1959, mm -hmm. that was something to take seriously, and it's something to take seriously again. Yes. So, so what, do you have any sense, and have you talked to anybody who, as far as you're concerned, has some reasonable vision about what actually might be done in a sensible manner on the Russia-Ukraine front? Like, well, the what? reasonable people who are rooted in reality and not fantasy understand that the only way to bring about an end to this war is through diplomatic means of bringing together the different stakeholders and actually coming to an understanding, whether it's through the form of a treaty or whatever that agreement may look like, where no one is going to walk away happy, but mm -hmm. there is... Uh, there is a reasonable approach to being able to find that agreement. You'll hear from the Biden administration anytime this is brought up, well, well, Zelensky and Ukraine have to be the ones to drive this. They're the ones yeah, who have to right. set the terms and everything else. The only way that they're able to continue doing what they're doing is through the means that the United States, largely the United States, but also some other countries in Europe, are providing mm -hmm. them with the weapons and the money and the ability to do so. So, the United States has President Biden. Yeah, we could has definitely a stop lying about. We could definitely stop lying about the fact that this is Ukraine. Yeah, exactly. Like nobody in there, nobody with any sense at all, believes that. I mean, we're in a proxy war for sure, and we have yes. been from the beginning. And so we yes. might as well be crystal clear about that. Exactly. So hey, so Trump popped up the other day as he pro has a proclivity to do, and he said, "If I was president, I'd stop this war in 24 hours." And you know that's typical Trump overstatement, I would say, but it is the case that the war emerged on Biden's watch and not Trump's watch, and that's not nothing. And so, um, what do you make of, what do you make of that? What do you make of Trump? <laughs> well, I mean, we diagnosed the Democrats Trump, a bit. Let's, let's yeah. turn to the Republicans. Uh, only Trump, only Trump knows uh, what, what Trump would be doing uh, in this situation. But as we're talking about a diplomatic end to this war, something that should have happened a very long time ago, something the Biden administration has been blocking, categorically blocking even efforts between Russian and Ukrainian officials on their own who are trying to come together. It's been the United States that has been blocking them, telling Ukraine, no, leave the table, don't negotiate. How, how have they been blocking? Do you, what are the there details are There are that? multiple reports publicly of, of uh, Biden administration officials telling Ukraine not to negotiate as well as other countries who have been also sharing that they've been getting that same message, going all the way back to, I think, uh, March, you know, yeah. shortly after this war kicked off, when there yeah, were- Yeah, I heard I mean, the same it, thing. I heard that from people I was talking to who knew what they were talking about in exactly. Israel, too, that the Russians, there were, there were avenues open quite early yes. in the conflict where diplomatic, diplomatic maneuvering could have hypothetically proved, proved useful, and that that yes. was blocked. Now, I'm not saying it would have been useful, but I couldn't understand when this all broke out why the number one priority of Western leaders who instead gathered to, you know, uh, make fun of, of Putin's hyper-masculinity, and it was a pretty sad bunch of wimps gathered around the G7 table who were managing that, I might say, right. instead of noting that if they had any sense at all, they'd be trying to broker something like an intelligent arrangement so that we didn't face the the likely possibility of being dragged by our shirt sleeve into the maw of the military industrial complex and end up all torn to shreds as a consequence, which right. I think is the most likely outcome of what's happening now. Because what I know something about World War I and World War II and one of the, and the other wars we've been in since is that what tends to happen is you get pulled in one stupid step at a time, especially if, 
If you're also turning a blind eye to the chicanery of your wealthy friends who are profiting like mad on the war front. And so yes. people always, I think they said, you know, when World War I started, it was like, the troops will be home for Christmas. It's like, <laughs> yeah, guess that didn't happen. And then it's many, many years later, and it's not like that didn't happen in Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan. Exactly. Like, this will be over soon. It's like, yes. yeah, I don't think so. That isn't how yes. these things worse work. No. And, so. and who walked away? Who walked away with the most profits in the war in Afghanistan alone? Major defense, major defense contractors. What does the Department of Defense have to say about the money that was spent there? They can't even account for right. the vast majority of money that was spent right. there. What can we yeah, say? Yeah, we're as a talking billi billions of dollars, billions or hundreds of billions of dollars. Yes, right? hundreds staggered. of billions of it's dollars. Trillions, if I remember correctly. Overall, it's, it's what was some, spent? Yes, trillions yes, of dollars well, were spent on that war. Spent and, trillions and of dollars unaccounted were made. for. Exactly. S spent and unaccounted for. Right. So yep. that's pretty damn convenient for who over trillions, those of, trillions of dollars for, these, went to. for the military industrial complex. And yeah. and then you know you have these defense contractors again saying publicly war is good for business. Period. Yeah. Full well, there's stop. no doubt it, about that. Exactly. If you're not on the front line, <laughs> war cuz your bank account isn't that useful to you when you're dead, but yes. if you're if someone else is dead and the consequence of that is that your bank account is accruing profits quite nicely, well, you know, yeah. that's that's all well and good especially if you're a psychopathic narcissist and it's all about you and that's right. and so and there's no shortage of that going around at the highest echelons of, of what would you call it, fascist collusion. And we're seeing that pretty much everywhere. Yeah. So, okay, so let's turn to the Republicans. We've, okay. We've, 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 we've had our shot at the warmongering Democrats, let's say. Um, although I think we'll return to their problems, but let's look at the Republican side. Now, you're sitting as an independent at the moment. That's correct. Yes. I've got that right. Yes, mm -hmm. good. Um, and... So you're not aligned with the Republicans or the Democrats, which either makes you extremely hard to get along with and someone no one likes, or <laughs> <laughs> right, because that's a possibility. Yeah. Or you know, or you're in a neutral position in some sense at the moment with a lot of experience on the Democrat front, right? A lot of detailed experience. And so, what what do you think's good about the Republicans, and what do you think they're lacking? Well, I think there there are a number of Republicans uh, who. Are a, obviously who are a part of this permanent Washington establishment. That whether we're talking about the issue of war and peace, or we're talking about, you know, the the crony capitalism. I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not against capitalism either. But you look at the crony capitalism of of industries like uh, big pharma, or the so-called healthcare industry that really doesn't care about people's actual health uh, and well-being. You could go kind of across the board of what is wrong with the corruption in permanent Washington where politicians are essentially paid off and therefore working for the interests of these industries rather than the interests of the people that they've been elected to serve. And there are both Republicans and Democrats who are not only entrenched in this, but who are in those positions because of this, this system. And, and it is what you know, is that's broken. outright fascism yeah. by, by definition, right? Yeah. Because the fascists, the definition of fascism is essentially corporate government collusion at the highest levels. Right. And so, yeah, the deep state that everyone paranoid is paranoid about, and for good reason, is essentially a collusionist fascist regime. And yes. increasingly an international collusionist fascist regime. And when people say crony capitalism, you know, it's a weak, it's a weak phrase for what's essentially a fascist enterprise. Right. So, and as you said, you know, there are people in the Democrat Party and in the Republicans who are pulled into that web of collusion, and and it's easy for that to happen too, because it is. Yeah, yeah. You well, get sucked you into the system quickly, and you think, well, this is just yeah. the way it works. And so, if I want to yeah. do anything in Washington, if I want to get anywhere, even people who people who I know who came in, I got elected with, best of intentions. Yeah. Uh, it, it is very quickly inculcated, like within the first few days of being there, that this is the way the world works, buddy. And if you want to get anywhere to be able to yeah. do what you came here to do, well, this is the game and the rules you've got to play yeah. by. Yeah. And then yeah. very quickly before you know it, uh, those, those good intentions that you came up with uh, are, are lost and you are no longer serving the interests of the people. You are serving, you have become a puppet of those yep. who are the puppet masters. Well, you are a neophyte when world. you first enter the ring, you know, even once you're elected. I mean, in terms of the constituents you represent, you're sort of at a pinnacle, but as a newbie in Washington, you know, what 
You're lost. They're freshmen. They're literally and called we, freshmen. You get elected. Exactly, you are right. the freshman you, class. <laughs> and you've got no knowledge and you've got no allies. And and of, and then there's also going to be the part of you that one hangs out, hang, wants to hang out with the cool kids. Exactly. And so, right, absolutely. And some yeah. of that's actually just humility, you know, is that because you don't have any allies or friends and you do need to know how the system operates. And so yes. that's a big problem. So what did you But you, you have face? to be grounded in principles. You have to go yeah. there and be grounded in your principles and your your mission and your purpose, uh, which was not just to go and like get along and be around this interesting group of people and get the f- fancy title, though that is some people's purpose. But in order to be truly effective there, uh, you have to go there and be very grounded in your principles and purpose so that you don't then become the puppet for uh, th- these other powerful interests. And, and that, yeah. that frankly is exactly what I went through is when I got to Washington, you know, I was lauded as like, oh my gosh, she's a rising star. The headlines, she's a yeah. rising star of the Democratic Party and, you know, checking all the different boxes of all the things that they look for, the labels that they look for. She's a woman of color. She's a veteran. She's this and she's that. And then they realized like, oh, hold on a second. She's not just going to allow us to control her. She's not just going to read the talking points that we send out in the morning email. She's not just going to vote based on the way that we tell her to do. Uh, they realized mm-hmm. that I did. I wasn't there. And, and we and was them. we was we the was we the DNC essentially. I mean, my experience with talking to congressmen in Washington has basically it's it's actually been somewhat it's been disenchanting, and I've also developed more sympathy for the Congress people. Because while they have hard jobs, it isn't obvious that anyone sensible would ever take that job, even though it's necessary <laughs> that they do. Well, the, sta- the, the, the new congressmen, they spend 20 to 30 hours a week fundraising. They can't do that in their offices. They have to rent another office and they spend all their time on their phone. So they're basically glorified televangelists or uh, telemarketers. Um, of them don't live in Washington and sleep in their offices, so there's no community there. They have to run for re-election every two years, which means that not only are they, you know, in a job that's very difficult as newbies, but it's a very unstable job. They've destabilized their families by doing so. It's hard for them to move their spouse to Washington. And then, and this I think is especially true on the Democrat side, but it's also true on the Republican side, they're facing constant pressure from the powers that be who are very entrenched to do nothing but raise money for the damn party, even though they waste almost all of that, and to toe the bloody party line. And of course, you have to have a certain amount of party discipline or you don't have a party. So anyways, that's a... Now, so why don't you... what, What real temptations did you face? And, you know, how did that warp you? Because there's no way you get through this without a certain degree of warping. And and how did you, and and to what degree were you successful in resisting that and and why did you manage it? So let's start with that. What were the major temptations facing you when you first went to Washington? Well, Well, like I said, within the first few days of arriving there, before even being sworn in as a member of Congress, uh, there was a, a bifurcation. We had we had 84 people who were elected to Congress in 2012, new members of Congress. Uh, I believe 50, if the number is right, I think there were 50 Democrats and 34 Republicans. And so for the first week that we were there in what they call freshman orientation, we were going through different policy briefings uh, with people presenting on, you know, a whole host of the issues that we face uh, and people presenting from different sides, different perspectives. Um, and we all went through that together. And then after that, it was, okay, Democrats, you're going to go here. Republicans, you're going to go there. And that's where uh, two things happened. Number one is, is the, the partisan direction coming to members of Congress, basically preaching, in a nutshell, it is party first. You will right, do what right. is best for the party first, rather than thinking about, well, what's in the best interest of uh, my constituents or what about if I disagree with the party and this is a decision that I want to make, you will make your decisions based on what's best for the party. If you have an idea to introduce a bill, best not to go work with someone from the other party because that'll make them look good. It'll make it harder for us to beat them in the next election. So not about how do we solve problems, not about how do we be effective in serving our constituents, all about the party power, keeping power, getting it back. Those are the two things. And both of us got those same messages from our respective political party leaders 
Mm -hmm. Part and parcel of that was exactly what you talked about. There was a, a PowerPoint slide that was put up. I remember it very distinctly because it was so shocking about here's what your day will look like and how many hours of the day, morning, noon, and night will be spent either at fundraisers with lobbyists representing different industries or, as you said, on the phone, off-site, making calls to those lobbyists to try to get more of them to come and give you money at the next day's fundraisers, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And as I was looking at this slide, it was split up hour by hour. Here's what your days will look like if you're yeah, doing your, your 16-hour days. Exactly. And yeah. how the vast majority of a single day was not spent studying issues that you would have to tackle in committee or you know, working on legislation that you're going to introduce. The vast majority of hours of that day would be spent fundraising from lobbyists representing special interests. And that's the expectation. Uh, to get on certain committees that you want to get on. You've got to give them, a, you got to give the party a certain amount of money and all, all of these different things. And, and that's the frustration that the American people have with our politics right now. And obviously it's been going on for a long time is they know, we know this. We can see through their results that they don't actually care about making decisions that, that are in the best interest of the people who are actually solving these problems. It's being reactive. And ultimately when it comes down to it, when you, you hear what they are saying, the, the, for example, like, oh, well, prescription drug prices are flying through the roof and people can't afford insulin. Diabetics can't afford insulin. And, you know, seniors can't afford the medicine that they need. But when you actually look at the results, even though politicians complain about it, there's not a regulation of big pharma that would actually seek to start solving some of these problems in the ways that people need help. And that's just one example of many. We'll be back in one moment. First, we wanted to give you a sneak peek at Jordan's new documentary, Logos and Literacy. I was very much struck by how the translation of the biblical writings jump-started the development of literacy across the entire world. Illiteracy was the norm. The pastor's home was the first school, yeah. and every morning it would begin with singing. The Christian faith is a singing religion. Probably 80% of scripture memorization today exists only because of what is sung. This is amazing. Here we have a Gutenberg Bible, a Bible printed on the press of Johann Gutenberg. Science and religion are opposing forces in the world, but historically that has not been the case. Now the book is available to everyone. From Shakespeare to modern education and medicine, and science to, to civilization itself. It is the most influential book in all of history, and hopefully people can walk away with at least a sense of that. You know, here's, here's maybe part of the underlying problem. So I went to the Republican Governors Association meeting in November, and I remember one of the people who presented, they were trying to rally the troops to some degree, sharing policy information amongst themselves as governors. And a lot of the Republican governors are pretty good at implementing, um, you know, micro policies. And, and there's something to be said for that, right? To, that boots on the ground, pragmatic um, um, competence. They weren't very good at um, putting forward a vision. And they weren't really very good at even rallying the fundraisers, you know, with a rousing call to action. And I think that's a problem on the Republican side. But one of the presentations was extremely interesting to me as someone interested in measurement because they, the person got up and talked about how effective the Republicans had been in certain jurisdictions, in certain key elections, in outspending the Democrats on the advertising front. And I thought, I thought three things at the same time. The first thing I thought is, there is almost no evidence that election spending has any effect whatsoever on the outcome of the election. It's a marginal effect at most. And so, and it's, it's so marginal that political scientists have been debating for 20 years about whether or not election spending helps at all, whether you're an incumbent or a challenger. And so the fact that, and then, so that's a big problem. It's like, it is not obvious that what you're paying for works. That's a big problem. Second, why in the world did we ever assume that the right metric for electoral uh, uh, competence in, in, in running a campaign is how much money you spend. 
No one in their right mind thinks that the right measure for doing a bathroom renovation properly is the fact that it cost a million dollars when it could have cost 10,000. Sure. That's just preposterous. So it's a, so it's a, a, you know, it's a measurement problem in the fundamental analysis. And then even worse on the Republican side, and I think I asked this question, which didn't make me very popular at the meeting itself, which is, I don't know if you noticed, but 95% of the legacy media to whom you're devoting all this money actually really can't stand you or anything you stand for and is completely 100% tilted against you. So on what grounds do you base your claim that spending more money than the Democrats feeding this god-awful legacy media machine is, well, it's not effective and it's counterproductive and they hate you, so what are you doing? And, and so then what happens in Washington, it's very similar, is the, the parties devolve to the simplistic notion that those junior congressmen who can beat the drum most effectively to raise money are ipso facto the most loyal and competent. And that's all based on a whole misapprehension of, it's a measurement problem. It's like the money you raise is not an indication of your competence. It's the same problem we were talking about with relationship to women in the military to begin with. What the hell are you measuring? Now, right. okay, you, now for whatever reason, you got on a lot of Democrat committees and you ended up as vice chairman. You had a pretty stellar career, very rapidly accelerating. Now, you claim that you weren't one of the junior Congress people that could be, you know, subsumed all that easily into the military industrial complex, for lack of a better word. So if that was the case, then why in the world were you also able to to move into leadership positions in the Democrat Party. Because hypothetically, you would have had to go along, and I, I'm sure you went along to some degree, but you would have to go along. That's what they're telling you. You have to mm -hmm. go along to get something done. But you're saying you didn't particularly go along, or at least not always, and yet you had a stellar career. So, so how, how is that possible? These opportunities, uh the, these, you know, vice chair of the DNC. We'll, we'll, we'll start with that one uh, because I was. I was a top official of the National Democratic Party from 2000, I guess I was sworn in January 2013 up until uh, my choice to leave that position in, in 2016. Um, I was sitting in a, the back seat of a car shortly, it was around the time of, of President Obama's uh, re-election inauguration. I got a phone call saying, hey, what would your answer be if you were asked to serve as vice chair of the DNC? I had been in office for less than a month. And my response to this person who called me was, uh, I don't know. What is a vice chair of the DNC? What do they do? What, what would the yeah. expectations be? What would, uh, you know, what kinds of things would I be able to do? Is this just a by name thing or would I actually be able to do something? I, I didn't have any idea what that was, uh, but I was offered that position and I thought, well, hey, I agreed to do it because I thought maybe this is an opportunity for me able to be, bring some and affect some change within yeah. the Democratic National Party. So these, a lot of these different things um, came came to me without me seeking them out at all. Why? Why? Because, why? Why? because why of you? what I talked about. They, <coughs> excuse me, they saw, um, they saw the superficial and they thought, well, this is somebody who we can, you know, if I did go along, I, I, I can imagine, I think it would be a safe assumption to say that, that they would have continued to push me up it, it, to the highest levels if I had been someone who, that they thought I was, that I would just go along and I could tell the story that they wanted to tell and say the things that they wanted me to say. And so when they asked me to be vice chair of the DNC, I had been in office less than a month. And, and who's they? Who's the they that are asking? It is, it is, it is you know, the, the Democratic leadership in Congress, uh, Democratic leadership uh, within, within the DNC. And also I got a lot of media coverage that I, I didn't have a press secretary, I didn't have a publicist, I didn't seek any of this stuff out, but I kept getting calls. Hey, we want you on our show. We want to feature you in this magazine. We want to do this, we want to do that. Right. And, and it, I, I questioned it a little bit, but ultimately I was like, hey, look, this is an opportunity for me to be able to reach out to people and say what I want to say and get across what I want to get across. So I took mm -hmm. advantage of those opportunities. Right. Right. 
Well, you um, checked the identity boxes. Exactly. And I presume that they exactly. thought that they were hoping that you might be. Well, I want to get back to this issue of they too. You know, my experience with organizations and activists, for that matter, is that the they turns out to be a very small number of people who are yes. very well connected, who are continually maneuvering. And yes. sometimes that's a consequence of their unbelievable competence. And sometimes it's a consequence of their unbelievable capacity to manipulate and and uh, capitalize on narcissism. And that's a, probably a problem in politics and entertainment and media more than anywhere else for obvious reasons. Um, and I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush because that's sure. That's foolish. But the they that are looking at you and thinking, well, you know, we could certainly look use someone with an image like hers for us. And that's not all cynical, by the way. Um, who who are the who are the people who are making those decisions as far as you're concerned? If we go back, say, well, when you were asked to serve as vice chairman. Who are making those who is making those decisions? Well, I mean, obviously Nancy Pelosi is one of them. Uh, you know, Debbie Wasserman Schultz was the the head of the the DNC at the time. Uh, there were people in the Obama administration. Uh, there are people who uh, were not elected officials, and and within the DNC, I'm sure there were probably political donors as well who had a part a part mm -hmm. of that. But but you know, we'll we'll start with Nancy Pelosi. I had won my primary election here in Hawaii uh, in August of 2012. And um, that in Hawaii, Hawaii is a very strong democratic state. That was essentially the election. I did have a Republican opponent and still had to go and win the general election, but uh, it was a safe assumption that I was going to, I, I had de facto already won uh, the election. And within a few weeks of winning that election, I had uh, gotten a call from Nancy Pelosi saying, would you like to come and speak during prime time at the Democratic National Convention that was gonna happen? Uh, shortly, shortly after that, this was in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, in 2012. Someone who had not even yet been elected to Congress for the first time being invited to speak on prime shocking. time. It was. I mm -hmm. was surprised. I, I was very I surprised. Uh, the topic she was asking me to talk about is one that is obviously near and dear to my heart to talk about veterans, and uh, and so I said yes, of course, I will do that. I went there and I spoke and I did interviews with just about every media channel that was out there. And, but, but all of these different things, you know, there, there were not opportunities that, that were given uh, to, to the vast majority of people, I guess I'll, I'll put it that way. Yeah, uh, yeah, but my yeah. decision, my decision uh, to leave as vice chair of the DNC was one of those pivotal moments where in the lead up to making that decision, it was, it was driven by a couple of things. One was the recognition of they're, they're, the rules of the DNC is that you're, you're as an officer of the DNC, you are not involved in uh, tilting the scales or getting involved in Democratic primaries, especially Democratic presidential primaries, that you have different candidates, they go out, they make their case, and then the party coalesces around whoever the winner of that primary is. Well, in the lead up to that 2016 primary election, I started to see very quickly that the decisions that were being made, not in consultation with us as vice chairs of the DNC, but unilaterally by Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was the chair, who was very close with Hillary Clinton, were made to give an advantage to Hillary Clinton. For example, limiting the number of debates where she would have to right, face right. Bernie Sanders, uh, putting them at times where, you know, I think there was one that was scheduled during like the Super Bowl or something like that when nobody was going to be watching or paying attention to mm -hmm. a presidential uh, debate. There were, there were uh, con new, newly implemented rules that said any Democratic presidential candidate that participates in a debate that is not sanctioned by the DNC will be banned from participating in any future DNC debate. And, and for mm. me, I'm just thinking like, if our, if our purpose and our cause is to increase involvement and engagement in our democracy, to get more people to pay attention, to learn more about these different candidates, to actually have a real dialogue about these important issues, why would you be punishing someone for going out and trying to engage in doing exactly that? Why would you be trying to limit the debate that the American people can be exposed to and involved with? And it was very clear uh, why those decisions were made to give an advantage to Hillary Clinton, who was designated as the one that the Democratic Party powers that be wanted to win that election. And so their mm -hmm. lack of integrity, uh, coupled with the fact that Hillary Clinton wanted to be our commander in chief, 
Uh, I still serve in the Army Reserves now for almost 20 years. So for me, as someone serving in the reserves at the time, as well as a member of Congress, as well as an American, to have her in a position where both Democrats and the mainstream media refused to challenge her on her record, both as a senator and in every position she had held, previous Secretary of State and so forth previously, on, on her she is, she is the queen of war hawks. She is the queen of warmongers. No one challenged her. They just said, well, she's got all these positions. She's the most qualified. I yeah, and so yeah. many of my brothers and sisters in uniform were like, hold on a second. You need to ask her and hold her to account for the con disastrous consequences for the decisions that she has made, the wars that she has advocated for, the things that she has done that has not only undermined our national security, but come at great cost to the men and women who why, volunteer why you, to serve this why country. Do you, why do you think, okay, two questions on the Hillary front. I mean, one of the reasons she terrified me, I suppose, is that it was pretty damn obvious that she's been aiming at the presidency for 50 years. Sure. And that's a long time, right? And you got to ask yourself, what is driving someone who's that committed to that goal. Like, and the goal is clearly the presidency. It's not what could be done with the presidency. And it's not like she was dragged in kicking and screaming by people who were overwhelmingly impressed by her prowess and who, you know, enjoined upon her for moral reasons to consider a career in government. It's like, no, 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 she's been laser focused on being the first female president of the United States for God only knows how long. And so that that's concerning to me. But then but then that doesn't answer the next or address the next mystery, which is, well, given that she's a Democrat and given that the Democrats should in principle be somewhat skeptical, let's say, of the a fascist collusion between corporation and government and a little bit skeptical on the military industrial side, why do you think that her record indicates that she's such a hawk on the military front. Like, is that a compensation? Is she attempting, to, this is a cheap, you know, psychological interpretation, could easily be wrong. Is she trying to look tough on the, on the foreign policy front to, you know, to mitigate against any criticism of the fact that she might not be capable of that? Or what's I don't going think on? Why is she I don't doing think that? That's, I don't think that's such a cheap uh, analysis or, or assumption to make because that, that, that is a reality, and that is one of my fears, not only about her, but also about some others who have been in those uh, types of position. Uh, you look at someone like Kamala Harris, for example. She's yeah, a breath yeah. away from the presidency, and I, I have lost track yes, of how many conversations. a feeble breath, unfortunately. Yes, exactly, hmm. which is incredibly concerning. I, I have lost track of how many uh, service members, American service members I have spoken with who are absolutely terrified uh, about the prospect of a President Harris. For that reason, she's, she's proven- You mean facing off against someone like Vladimir Putin, for example? Wouldn't that or, be lovely? Or, Kamala or, Harris versus exactly. Vladimir Putin. Oh yeah. Or, or, or anyone, but somebody like her uh, who is weak, who lacks understanding in foreign policy, who feels the need to prove herself, to mm -hmm. prove her strength, to, to stand up with the big boys and look yeah. tough and somehow believe that, well, hey, the best way to do that is to go drop some bombs somewhere and start a war. Uh, this, this is a, a terrifying prospect uh, for someone. And, and you see this, yes, with, with some women who feel like they have to go and look tough, but that only happens if they're not actually strong, internally strong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. individuals themselves. But we also see, the, see this with some of the, the, the male uh, leaders yeah, in this yeah, country. Yeah, yeah. We saw how, yeah, yeah. you know, um, how people react, again, like in the media and in media, how the media and politics, how they react uh, when we go to war. We saw how Nancy Pelosi and Brian Williams and others declared Donald Trump, this is the first time he seems presidential when he decided to go and launch some rockets and missiles against Syria. People who hated him, people yeah. who could not stand him and were obsessed with trying to destroy President Trump, all of a sudden he goes and launches some bombs and they're all over the television saying, well, finally, he's acting like a president. Give me a break. Right, right. This is yes, the problem well. with the lack of leadership that we have and how you, 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 know, you started this question asking about how is it the Democratic Party that should be the party that is at, at a minimum skeptical and cynical about 
the military industrial complex and going out and starting new wars and regime change and all of this stuff, well, they have become party to it, part and parcel of it, and have become that machine that benefits from all of this. Mm -hmm. And so they can't. It would be self-defeating for them to now exercise skepticism or challenge. And this, you know, I want to I want to jump back to a question you asked earlier we didn't get to finish, which was what are some of the positive things that I'm seeing in the in the Republican party right now? We see at a minimum there are dissenting voices within the Republican party, for example, on the issue mm -hmm. of this proxy war against Russia. There are not enough to be able to make a legislative change at this point. I hope that changes. But there are a growing number of Republicans who are saying no, expressing a lot of the concerns that we are. And from a Republican Party perspective, there's no, I'm not aware of any punitive measures being taken against those members. So even though they are not part of the establishment in the Republican Party, um, there is that room for dissent. There is, and I've experienced this myself, there's that room for open conversation and dialogue. Whether you agree or disagree, there's a growing movement of concern about, you know, these wars and a movement for peace and respons a responsible foreign policy. Whereas the Democratic Party has moved in the opposite direction where you are not allowed to ask questions. You are not allowed to challenge their narrative or their position. You are not allowed to hold a dissenting view uh, because if you do, then they will seek to destroy you and cancel you and smear you uh, and and take away away your voice and and it's it's really sad and unfortunate because there's there's nothing more undemocratic than that. Right, right. Well, look, I would love to continue talking to you on the YouTube platform, um, but we're I know you have a hard out in about half an hour, and I would have really liked to have talked to you some more about Trump. But we and should about do this leaders. again. We should do this again, and we'll find it. We'll find a time that's appropriate and do it again. But, Wonderful. Um, I would just, uh, I just ask you one final question on this sure. uh, um, in this episode. Then, for everyone watching and listening, I'm going to continue talking to Tulsi Gabbard on the Daily Wire Plus platform. I'm going to do a little bit more biographical interrogation, let's say, and uh, that'll be available for those of you who want to go over to the Daily Wire Plus side of the world, let's say. And, uh, but but I'll, maybe we could close with this. So what do you, what what are your future plans at the moment? Where, where do you see yourself going? Because you're in an odd political position at the moment, to say the least. You have this immense wealth of experience and 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 uh, reputation, hard earned, and 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 you're in a um, idiosyncratic position, and you're quite young as well, all things considered by political standards, and so. What, what, where do you foresee yourself going, and where would you like to go, and and in in the in the in the in the next few years, and maybe even longer than that? Uh, I will. The, the short answer is, is I, I don't exactly know specifically, but what I do know is that I will continue to do what I've done uh, throughout throughout my life, which is seek out those. Uh, opportunities and places where I feel I can make the most positive impact and be of service, uh, be of service to God, be of service to to our country and, and the American people. I always like talking to you Americans. You're so good at that sort of thing, you know, <laughs> that, that whole Mr. Smith goes to Washington thing, which is, well, it's real, you know, and I've it seen that. Real. It is real. It is real. And I've seen that among uh, Democrats and Republicans alike. You know, there is, despite everything that divides people in the United States, um, and despite you know all the possibility of corruption and all of that, there is still this underlying belief in the goodness of the essential goodness of the system and this real desire on behalf of people to to be of genuine service and to put themselves on the line for it. It's no joke to give up your life to to become a congressman or congresswoman. It's a very tough decision. And um, we need we need leadership. I think I think the thing that just to to close out uh, that that point here is. Um, there is promise in this system, but the system is extremely dysfunctional and corrupt right now. And so whether it's what I'm doing now and being able to speak the truth and try to bring some common sense and reality and sanity to the insanity that we are going through in this country that is threatening our constitutional rights, that is threatening our, our own democracy, I will continue to seek ways to be, uh, to help lead that change uh, to get us back to the kind of country that our founders envisioned for us. Hmm. Well, that's a very good closing. And so we will turn now 
to to the to the Daily Wire Plus part of this uh, All right. conversation. Thank you very much for talking to me today. Thank that was you. Extraordinary. I look forward. I look forward to part two. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. And so, and so for all of you watching and listening, thank you very much for your time and attention. It's much appreciated. And to the Daily Wire Plus people who are producing this, the film crew that's here in Detroit, because that's where I am today. Thank you for your help. And uh, onward and upward to the next part of the conversation. Very good to meet you. Hello, everyone. I would encourage you to continue listening to my conversation with my guest on dailywireplus.com.